Hi guys and welcome to another boxing related video. This time we're going to be talking about the energy systems of boxing. So this content is inspired by a question from Joe Cheevers who asks about the differences between aerobic and anaerobic training and how he can manipulate these to get the best results from his conditioning training for his upcoming bout in March. Now I'm going to explain uh, what mistakes people make with their conditioning in relation to not understanding this, why it's important that you do understand this and how it's going to help you structure your training moving forward. If you have any questions following this, then feel free to contact me via the details on the screen. And if you would like to support more content, feel free to subscribe to my YouTube channel and to sign up to my Patreon to request content for you. Now I'm going to start with my philosophy when it comes to conditioning training for boxing. And the reason why this is important is because a lot of stuff that I see violates this principle. If you don't have a principle for your training, then you've got nothing to guide what you're doing. And what that means is you're making it up as you go along. Now, if you were going to go into the ring, do you want to be the guy who's had everything planned and has a reason underpinning his training or the guy who just turns up and fingers crossed he's going to win hopes for the best. Now, the goal of an energy system development program for boxing should be the highest intensity efforts repeated with the greatest frequency possible. Now, this sounds great, but what does it even mean? So firstly, highest intensity efforts possible. That is your anaerobic system. That is the hardest you can punch, the fastest you can punch. That is your high intensity. Now, repeated with the greatest frequency possible, that's where your aerobic system comes into play. This is what's going to allow you to repeat those explosive actions. It's no good being absolutely lethal in round one and being that power puncher that everyone fears only to blow the gasket in round two and you're like a pussycat. Now we get on to energy systems. Now, in simplistic terms, as far as we're aware, we have three energy systems. Now, the important thing to note is these energy systems are not on or off. It's not a light switch. Um, although kids are taught this at PE theory level, um, it's probably just to oversimplify things. Now, these three systems, the best analogy I can give you is to compare them to another fuel source. So your ATP PC system, this is like having a match. You can light it very quickly. You get the fuel source very quickly, also disappears very quickly. So although it's quick, it's also easy to use up. That's the equivalent of your one punch knockout. Anything under about 10 seconds is your ATP PC system. Your glycolytic system is the equivalent of newspaper. So newspaper is going to burn for a little bit longer and it's going to last about one to two minutes but then you've got to go and get some more. This is the equivalent of your, uh, this is what I would call your stoppage system. So if you've got an opponent pinned against the ropes, you want to be able to have the power to be able to put them away. And finally, you've got your aerobic system. Now, this is what I would call your decision system. This will help you uh, recover in between rounds. This is what's going to help you recover in between training sessions. And ultimately, you're going to need a good aerobic system if you want to win on points. Now, although this is an overly simplistic way of looking at things, it shouldn't be that, oh, I want a knockout, so I must work the ATP P system and that alone. But it's a good way of guiding our training thoughts. So your, air, your anaerobic systems, your ATP PC, and your glycolytic system. So anything that's under roughly two minutes work is going to be your anaerobic system, provided the intensity is high enough. If you're just cruising around the ring, as you see boxers when they pretend that they're not tired and they start getting up on their toes, their aerobic system's still working because the intensity is slightly lower. So again, anything under 10 seconds, ATP PC, anything 10 seconds to about uh, a minute, minute and a half is when you're going to start dipping into the glycolytic system and anything two minutes or above aerobic system. As I said, these are not specific prescriptions. It's not like, for example, you start working for 11 seconds and now you're all of a sudden you're completely glycolytic. It's a dimmer switch and the uh, better conditioned your energy systems are, the longer that you can use them for. 
So here's an interesting case study um, that I've seen presented before. Now, anaerobic distance capacity, I want you to think of this as your finishing power. So for example, if you said to a boxer, right, you've got 30 seconds to unload on your opponent, get to work, that's probably the best analogy that I can give. So in this example, you've got two boxers, one uh, boxer one, you can see his anaerobic distance capacity. This is the distance he can travel using his anaerobic system. So not using oxygen. And boxer two, again, you can see it's a lot less. Now my question is, who would you rather be? Now, if this was the only data we had to go off, you'd think, well, I wanna be boxer one. They're a lot more powerful. Their anaerobic system is stronger, which means they're gonna be punching harder and possibly faster. How about now? So critical speed, now we're looking to the aerobic side. Critical speed is the fastest you can travel while still using predominantly your aerobic energy system. Now, the reason why I say predominantly is because even if you were to, for example, run a one mile race. Now, predominantly, majority of that would be aerobic. However, you're gonna have parts in the race, for example, if you need to kick on, that's gonna be anaerobic. If you're sprinting at the start to get ahead, that's gonna be anaerobic. So it's impossible to completely isolate the two. However, there are ways of being a little bit more accurate and understanding whether you should prioritize anaerobic or aerobic. That's for a different video, but I'm uh, gonna just give you a little example now. So if we imagine this blue line is the intensity that the fight takes place at. Now, as I've said, critical speed using your aerobic system is sustainable. Anything above critical speed is an unsustainable intensity. So in this example, Boxer two is at their critical speed, they're fine, they're cruising. Boxer one is having to come up to meet them there. So now what's gonna happen is they, boxer one is working anaerobically, which we know is not sustainable. They're gonna be producing lactate, which isn't necessarily the bad guy, but it does interfere with muscle function. So in this scenario, if the, if the fight is fought at the intensity of the blue line, that's when boxer one is really gonna to start to struggle. So how do we find the sweet spot between being explosive, powerful athlete, whilst also not running out of gas? So the first thing I would say is you need to assess where you're at. If you don't know where you're strong or where you're weak, how do you know what to prioritize? So simple ways of testing the ATP PC system, that's gonna be activities that occur in under 10 seconds. Now, what I'd like to get a measure on is something like a standing long jump. The power from a punch predominantly comes from your legs, so it makes sense to test the power that we've got available. Also can be done for free, grab a tape measure and line up with your toes behind the line, jump as far as you can, and the distance between where you started and the back of the heel is your distance. Having a single leg hop for distance as well can also show you power left versus right and whether there is a need for any single leg training to try and amend any asymmetries. Finally, a medicine ball for throw for distance, get in your boxing stance and launch it as far as you can. Weighing about three to four kilos will probably give you good accuracy. Now, if these numbers are going up with your strength and conditioning program, you can say with reasonable confidence you are getting more powerful. If these numbers start to drop off massively, you need to be looking at your strength and conditioning program and your boxing program and be questioning whether you've actually factored in recovery. Going back to my earlier example about one boxer having everything planned and one boxer trying to wing it, that's the problems you're gonna run into. Yeah, you might by some luck stumble across a brilliant training program by chance, but why would you take the risk if you can afford not to? So those are our measures of the ATP PC system. Other tests which I like, if you've got access to them, a six second watt bike uh, test and seeing how many watts you can hit is also useful because it's showing you the greatest intensity you can reach whilst using that ATP PC system. And finally, getting onto the aerobic system. So this is gonna help us repeat our high intensity efforts. Now, in terms of a cheap option that's realistic for most people, most people don't have access to exercise physiology labs, a five minute time trial for max distance. So find yourself a 400 meter track, set your timer for five minutes, cover as much distance as you can. Now, I'd even potentially go a step further than this. And one test I really do like 
if you're a boxer who fights three three minute rounds then find yourself an athletics track so you can at least be consistent with the distance garmin watches mm, google maps if you were to run that one mile distance and then repeat it again in the same place yep fine fair enough but if you're doing it different distances these things aren't anywhere near as accurate as you think they are another test i like as i said if you box three three minute rounds then clock as much of a distance as you can in three minutes rest one minute repeat this twice more now if the distance you achieve cumulatively or on average is going up with your strength and conditioning program you know you're in a good place now there's several ways which you can look to improve this distance which is also going to correlate nicely to the intensity that you can hold in the ring which i will get onto now also key component before i go on is we still power is strength times speed a lot of boxers neglect the strength side of things because they think they're going to get bulky that's just because they're looking at the way bodybuilders strength train so by having an idea of your sprint speed and your strength this is going to influence your power again if power is speed times strength by increasing one of those variables we are going to get more powerful so what about the glycolytic system we've got our atp pc system that's not 10 seconds aerobic probably anything above one or two minutes but what about everything that's in between now the glycolytic system or the lactate system as it's sometimes referred to doesn't play nice what i mean by that is the energy cost of doing proper lactate training is brutal you're probably going to want to have it where if you are doing lactate training which i'll explain why you might do that in a second you probably want the next day to be a lighter day you do not want to have your lactate training on monday and then be sparring intensely on a tuesday so this is your stoppage system this is how intensely can you perform exercise within probably the 10 to 30 second range anything after that in the aerobic system kind of just takes over now you might think high levels of lactate i've heard that lactate's the bad guy it interferes with muscle function that's not good i don't want that let me put it to you this way if you've got high levels of lactate what that suggests is you've got a really powerful anaerobic system when i did my dissertation on the effects of uh, caffeine ingestion and boxing performance what i found was that the boxers who were more powerful i.e they hit harder produce higher levels of lactate so what we want in an athlete is someone who can produce high levels of lactate because that indicates that they are very powerful over that 10 to 30 second time frame but also with the aerobic system which can help us use this lactate as a fuel source so how and when should we train for it this is something someone else asked me on instagram um, that's been getting me thinking of late but i'm going to try and make it as simplistic as i can again this diagram on the next page is probably overly simplistic but i think as a general rule it works pretty nicely so my first thing is do you have a resting heart rate below 60 now the reason why i say this is because if you've got heart rate below 60 it probably indicates that your aerobic system is in a reasonable place if it's not then what's going to happen when you try lactate training so for example 30 seconds all out intensity two to five minutes rest what's going to happen with that type of training is you just won't recover in the rest period so you'll do one rep and that'll be great and then the second rep you'll just absolutely die and you won't be getting the physiological benefit from the lactate training now if we go back to the example of boxer one and boxer two effectively what you're doing if you don't have an aerobic base is you're asking somebody who is for example at this level to come all the way up here and it's so high that they just can't recover in time so if you don't have a resting heart rate below 60 prioritize aerobic training methods i would recommend would be uh, tempo work so for example 70 percent of your best 400 meter time is a good pace to be at it's not so intense that it's going to burn you out but it's intense enough from an aerobic perspective that it's just going to nudge up that aerobic system long slow distance runs i'm not a massive fan of if you were getting into boxing and let's say it was one of these events where for example you've got eight weeks to get fit and it's a charity bout and you've never boxed before any training is going to be good for you but if you've been training a while the effect of those recovery run if it's a three out of ten fine but don't be expecting to push your physiology too much with those type of runs uh 
maximal aerobic speed type training again not a bad uh, not a bad option in terms of being able to quantify the uh, intensity and repeated speed training believe it or not can actually improve your aerobic system as well but i'll explain that in a future video so if you do have a resting heart rate below 60 that indicates you've got a reasonable aerobic system my next question is are you strong now the reason why i ask this is because it's not about being the strongest athlete in the gym it's about being strong enough what i mean by this is strength translates really nicely to power up to a certain point so if you've never strength trained then that's a big window of opportunity for you to increase your power without necessarily working on speed without necessarily working on power there's low hanging fruit to be had now the reason why i say one and a half times body weight uh lower body lift is because for me that's when i've started to notice gains in power up until that point now not to say that they you all of a sudden get worse it's just if you imagine if i can angle my camera if you imagine there's your improvements getting towards that one and a half times body weight and then you're still improving but not as much so if you're not at that one and a half lower body lift and by lower body lift i'm talking about a trap bar deadlift a squat even though leg press gets a bad reputation if you haven't got anyone to teach you how to squat or teach you how to deadlift properly it's still an option there's enough research to say that just being generally strong will improve uh, explosive performance so it's not the worst option in the world so if you haven't got that one and a half times body weight deadlift or squat then get stronger for boxing using two to five sets of three to five reps make it easier than you think it needs to be heavy but it's not going to feel like your conditioning training. You shouldn't be coming out of your strength sessions being like, wow, my muscles are sore. If they are, you're doing too much volume. As I said, you just need to be strong enough. You don't need to be the strongest in the gym. Once you've got that underpinning aerobic base and that underpinning strength level, are you explosive? Because strength will translate to power up to a point, but then you're going to need to include explosive exercises. So this is going to be stuff like plyometrics, different jumping variations pure speed work and finally are you repeatedly explosive again as i said this is an overly simplistic diagram but for me shows you where the low hanging fruit is now from personal experience uh, a couple of years ago i tried training for the 400 meters now because of my powerlifting background and my strength base i could clock a 400 meters in 63 seconds which is reasonable it's not blowing anyone out of the water in terms of uh, world class level but it's pretty reasonable now i had that strength base when i tried the lactate training even though i kind of knew it was not the best decision given that i didn't have an aerobic base still wanted to trial it because i wanted to know that when i'm recommending something to people it's not just something that's research based it's something i've tried and tested myself what was happening was that initial 30 second burst for example uh, i was generating a really high intensity but then I just died of death and even with five minutes rest, couldn't get anywhere near the first 30 second interval. So you do need an aerobic base. Resting heart rate is a good way to test that. Measuring how much work you can do in an aerobic time frame, uh, also quite a nice way of testing it. As I said, uh, in three minutes, it, I'd say just off the top of my head, if you're not clocking 800 meters in three minutes, then stick to the aerobic uh, type training or prioritize aerobic type training should i say before you start worrying about the more advanced stuff with lactate when i say prioritize i mean that is where most of your efforts go what i'm not saying is do only aerobic training and never sprint never strength train and never train to be more explosive okay so if i was to put this diagram on instagram i'm sure other strength and conditioning coaches would be looking at it and think mm, no i don't quite agree with that but it's the context it's that you're going to place most of your training efforts towards where you're going to get the biggest return on investment you're not necessarily laying all of your eggs in that basket per se so we've got a brief understanding of energy systems but we're not entirely sure what that might look like in the ring what it might look like in uh, the strength and conditioning suite so let's go through some examples now remember all energy systems are working at all times even a long slow distance run will use the atp pc system for example when you just go from a standing start to actually getting yourself moving or when you go for your sprint finish so that's impo also important to bear in mind the potential spillover effects 
So ATP PC, we know it re works in the first 10 seconds of exercise. So that's going to be our one punch knockout. That's going to be our strength training where we're lifting heavy weight for one to five reps. Plyometrics, so explosive type jumping work. Pure speed work. So when I say pure speed work, if I was to sprint 30 meters, have a 10 second rest and then keep repeating, the first rep is pure speed, but now I'm just getting tired and fatigued. Going back to my philosophy of uh, training, highest intensity possible, repeated as frequently as possible. So yes, you get the high intensity with the first one, the other one's not so much. Pure speed training, you're looking at about one minute rest per every 10 meters covered. Now this blows a lot of boxers' minds, but if I was to do a pure speed session and I'm going 30 meters, I'm gonna need about three minutes to recover if I'm a powerful athlete. Now, if we were to time it with speed gates, you'd soon see your time drop off if you give yourself any less rest than that. The glycolytic work, as I said, this is that nasty lactate lung burning uh, feeling. So this is your accumulation of punches in a short burst. So you pin someone against the ropes, 30 seconds to put them away. Um, and on the track, what that might look like is 30 to 45 second efforts, trying to gather as much distance as possible with two to five minutes recovery. Another point to make on the time frames of the different energy systems is that just because you worked in the time frame that the diagram said does not necessarily mean you use that energy system. For example, if I go for a 10 second walk, that is probably going to be predominantly aerobic, even though it's the 10 second time frame. And finally, your aerobic energy system. So this is your grind out your decision. This is your recovery between rounds. And even in the rounds when you're sort of cruising and you're just trying to pick your shots off. If you were to look at heart rate data from a bo uh, boxing bout, what you'd see is massive spikes and then the heart rate coming back down, assuming that you're fit. Again, that aerobic system helps us to recover between our flurries of punches. Again, I know I've spouted different time frames at you. That's not important. The important thing is that anaerobic exercise is not really sustainable at that sort of intensity. Aerobic is more sustainable. The higher your uh, sustainable pace, the better your aerobic system is. Now, what might this look like in a boxing session? So one question I get asked when it comes to recommending the conditioning sessions is, can I do it in my boxing gym? Now, if, for example, you are an amateur boxer, you don't get paid to box, you've got work, family, other life commitments, you can do it. The reason why it's not as effective is because of the amount of muscle mass used. Now, if I'm going to hammer the bag for 30 seconds, as the example in the glycolytic thing, yes, my lungs will be burning. Yes, my arms will be working. But the intensity compared to an all out sprint for 30 seconds, especially if you've got some strength and power in those legs, is not quite the same. Yes, it'll be hard. Not quite the same. Now, uh, where this gets interesting is if we were to use, for example, longer or shorter rounds. Now, what I would say is, for example, four minute rounds. Yeah, good. Some coaches like it because it's just lower duration. You're learning the technical skill. Some coaches don't because they say that it ignores the specificity principle. What I would say is most people misunderstand the concept of specificity and that general training can actually be beneficial. You're never going to get into the ring, put a bar on your back and back squat. But what you are going to do in the ring is um, have an explosive action that comes from the ground up and is driven from the legs being driven into the floor. So if you like it, great, use it. If you don't, don't worry. But I would argue that four minute technical rounds Again, you're probably not pushing physiology too much. That's why in conditioning programs, I like to break it up into intervals. So, for example, 30 seconds on, 15 seconds off, repeat times four. What this also looks like, if you've been following my stories on Instagram, is two minutes on, one minute off, which we've already seen in other research. Two minutes on, one minute off at 80% VO2 max pace seems to be the optimum intensity for improving something called buffering capacity. In simple terms, buffering capacity is your ability to recover between high intensity efforts. This is why we can't just wing our conditioning. We need to know what intensities we're going for, at what points in our training program, at what time. So to summarize, generally speaking, what I would do, the further out from the fight, I'd be looking to lay the foundations by improving my aerobic base. So by either tempo work, by either runs at 70% of my 400 meter time or by interval work. I'm also going to be working on pure speed work. What I've done there is lay the foundation for when I want to get onto, for example, 
30 seconds of highest intensity work or repeated speed work, I've laid the foundation because I've got fast, I've got strong and I've got powerful in the initial uh, four weeks of camp. And I don't think realistically you can use boxing to get fit. What often happens is you'll sign up to a boxing club, you've never done any boxing, you get three months in, you think, wow, I'm getting so fit. But then, you, because there's no real plan, you just kind of plateau out. And that's where I think you need specific conditioning uh, considerations for improving your boxing. So, as I said, I'd start with the aerobic stuff, get strong, get fast, plenty of rest between reps. Then I get to the point where I'd still continue to strength train, but I'd start to have some power exercises. I'd start to use repeated speed. So rather than three minutes, run 30 meters with three minutes rest in between, I might be doing something like four times 30 meters with say a minute rest. Still enough time to get your high intensity in, but you're still challenging the body to repeat the intensity more frequently. And finally, if you have a good aerobic base, if you are fast and explosive, and you've got the ability to repeat that, there's certainly nothing wrong with lactate training where you're doing, for example, 30 seconds on, two to five minutes off. But this training is probably out of reach for most people. But if you are going to do it, make sure that the next day is lighter because you'll need it. So thank you for listening. I hope that I've made some sense of that. If you've got any questions, feel free to get in touch. If you found this useful, please subscribe to my YouTube channel and support more content via Patreon, where I'll be answering people's personalized questions in detail for a small fee that goes towards my time and effort for putting these presentations together. As I said, any questions, get in touch, and I hope you found that useful.